you standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Stands there number four as we're standing on the promises. Amen. Stands there number four. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Well, uh, let's turn over to our next song there. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Amen. And if you have a hymnal, that is number 38. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. A beautiful old hymn of worship to the Lord. Amen. And so uh, uh, our next song on our song sheet here tonight. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, hail Thee as the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Give her of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, whale and mountain, blossoming meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Stanza 4. Mortal, join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us, brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music left us onward in the triumph song of life. Amen. And uh, we always need to remember, amen, good days and bad days, sunshiny mornings and cloudy, rainy evenings. We always got all the reasons to rejoice in our Savior, amen. Not always in the circumstances. Not always good reasons to rejoice in how we might feel at the moment, but we always do have a reason to rejoice in that Jesus Christ loves us and what he has all done for us. Amen. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer tonight. Father in heaven, uh, we're so grateful for each and every soul that you have brought out uh, into our fellowship here tonight. And Father, 
Most of all, we want to ask that you're in our midst. Lord, all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. And so, Lord, we do pray and ask that you would just be pleased to uh, meet with us. Lord, that you would be pleased to uh, speak to each and every one of our hearts and help us and guide us, Lord, to move ever closer to thee and to walk in closer fellowship with you. Father, I pray you to just give us a blessing from your word in a very special way for everyone that you've brought out tonight. And we pray this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, once again, so good to see each and every one tonight. And I want to just want to remind us once again of our upcoming services. Thursdays we meet again at 7 p.m. for prayer and Bible study, followed by our uh, time together in prayer. And so, um, of course, if you uh, we, we uh, live stream the, the service and then the prayer time just through Zoom meetings. And so um, uh, make sure to come out for that. Amen. Always in person is by far the best. And so um, uh, let's also continue to pray for each and everyone's health. Amen. Uh, as we continue to move through this interesting year of 2020. Amen. And God is still good even this year. Now, uh, uh, also uh, remember... Uh, our upcoming service is next Sunday, 10 o'clock Sunday school, uh, 11 a.m. morning service, and uh, 6 p.m. our evening service. And so uh, if, if you'd like to continue to give, of course, as I was mentioned, you have the offering plates laying out there for you if you want. And you can do that online as well by sending uh, your giving to ccbcgiving at gmail.com. And so uh, uh, praise the God for all of your faithfulness in that. And that's all the announcements we have for tonight. Um, uh, remember, Jelly's birthday, I believe, is this week on Tuesday. Amen. And we mentioned it this morning. And so uh, remember also our Bible memory verse, Titus chapter 3, verse 6. Titus chapter 3, verse 6. And um, we have one more song on our song sheet for tonight. Uh, number 156 in our hymnal. It's entitled, Christ Returneth. Amen. Christ returneth. And what an exciting truth, what an exciting expectation to live in. So if we can, let's uh, stand one more time this evening. And we want to sing Christ returneth. And we'll sing the first, uh, second, and fourth stanza. It may be at morn when the day is awaking, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive the world his own. Oh, Jesus, how long, how long, ere we shout the glad song, hallelujah, Christ returneth, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. Before we go in the second stanza, who is familiar with this song? Who knows Christ's return? All right, just a few of us. We'll learn it together, amen? It's a very exciting a song of triumph, of joy. So stanza number two. It may be at midday, it may be at twilight, it may be perchance at the blackness of midnight will burst into light in the place of his glory when Jesus receives his own. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. Verse 4. O oh, joy, O oh, delight, should we go without dying? No sickness, no sadness, no dread and no crying. Caught up to the clouds with the Lord into glory when Jesus receives 
to song. Oh Lord Jesus, how long, how long have we shout the sad song? Hallelujah, Christ returneth. Hallelujah, man. Hallelujah, amen. Amen. And even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. And this time, we'll have an offertory uh, uh, instrumental special. And after that, we will go into our message for this evening. Chester, I appreciate that. Well, once again, it's uh, good to see you tonight, and uh, we'd like to continue in our Sunday evening series on funny Bible stories and what we can learn from them. Amen. We've uh, looked at so many different examples where we do see that God has, in one way or another, indeed a sense of humor. Amen. Uh, do you believe that God has a sense of humor? I certainly do. And I believe we can see that uh, very clearly uh, uh, also peeking through throughout Scripture. We've uh, looked at who is the fastest disciple. Uh, that was really entertaining um, and a lot to learn there as well. Uh, we've looked at uh, many different other stories. We looked at when more is not better, right? Uh, how Pharaoh asked for more frogs instead of less. <laughs> um, and this evening, I'd like to uh, preach about a deadly conspiracy. Ooh, <laughs> a deadly conspiracy. Now, this is going to be unlike any of those crazy YouTube videos or Facebook posts that you're probably going to be, uh, uh, that you're probably being bombarded with in regards to all sorts of uh, uh, things, whether it's... Um, uh, uh, technology or diseases or governments or rich guys. I mean, you name it, it's always in that cocktail of conspiracies included. Amen? And so let's be very careful about those things and uh, really um, rather focus upon those things we do know for sure, which is the truth of God's word uh, and that, that solid rock that we can build uh, our life upon. Amen. And um, uh, tonight, though, uh, we do want to look at one conspiracy that we do find very clearly in the Scriptures, and that really, when we look at the details, can be quite amusing, I find, anyways. You know, we've mentioned how a uh, merry heart does good like a medicine. And, you know, a lot of people are discouraged, a lot of people are anxious, a lot of people are fearful and worried these days, and I really believe we need to get our focus back on rejoicing in the Lord. I think we really ought to encourage one another on seeing uh, the good things in the life that God has blessed us with. And, um, you know, it's easy to get distracted, to stress out. And yet, we find that in so many details of the Word of God, there's really some really um, either amusing or entertaining or just humorous aspects that we can find. And tonight, I want to start in Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23 in verse 11. Acts chapter 23 in verse 11. Acts chapter 23, verse 11.
We read there, and the night following, the Lord stood by him. Now, this is talking about the Apostle Paul, and he was unjustly imprisoned for, uh, you know, preaching the gospel and just some of the controversy that comes with that and that was stirred up, especially among the religious crowd there in Jerusalem. And, um, and so he's spending a night there in the prison cell, and the Lord stood by him, and it says, and said, be of good cheer. Amen. Now, let me just stop right here. If you do not get much else out of this message, just leave it that phrase. Be of good cheer. Amen. Why can't I be of good cheer? Because the Lord wants to stand by you. Just like he did with the Apostle Paul in the darkness of midnight, in the most loneliest and coldest and dreariest of prison cells, the Lord stood him. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul had the testimony at the end of his life when all men forsook him, yet the Lord stood with him. And that is something that you will find consistently as you trust in God. That even when no one else will stand with you, even when things seem complicated or contrary to you, God will still be faithful. And, 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 and really, if you think about it, it makes sense. Why wouldn't he? He's paid a huge price for you, for you to be his beloved child. I mean, he's paid an infinite and, 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 and uncalculated uh, an amount that, you, that cannot be calculated up in gold or silver for your soul and for my soul. How in the world would God make such an investment and then just drop it like a hot potato? <laughs> of course he wouldn't. And so God stands, especially with those that are in need of good cheer. Amen? And so be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou also bear witness also at Rome. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. So these guys were dead serious, literally. <laughs> Amen. Um, verse 13. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. This conspiracy. Now, I looked up the definition of the word conspiracy, and it is a combination of uh, men that have united to accomplish an evil purpose. That's what the conspiracy is about. It can also be a concurrence. In other words, a general tendency of two or more causes to one event. Um, and, and it really talks about uh, people who conspire secretly and agree together to cause injury or overthrow, for example, a government. So in other words, when people conspire, it's usually to no good. <laughs> All right? Um, that's basically what this is about. And of course, these um, uh, religious leaders of the Jews there in Jerusalem, um, these, these, uh, uh, um, they obviously were up to no good neither. And they banded, they united together for the singular purpose of ending Paul's life. And so... Sadly, the story ends with that, where Paul is really just being killed and slain, and unfortunately, it's, it's just a terrible end of that story, right? No, no, you're shaking your head. That's not how that ends, does it? And that's where really the, uh, the really bit of amusing parts come in, comes in here. Remember, the Lord stood with him, right? Now, all these other guys, with all their money, with all their power and all their influence, had conspired, had united against God's child, the Apostle Paul. And yet we find that they will not accomplish the evil purposes at all. Why? Well, because the Lord stood with them. Amen? Folks, you want to be sure to be on the Lord's side. Amen? You want to be sure to always be as close to the Lord as you can because you definitely want Him to stand with you and especially in the evil day, as the Bible calls it. Now, verse 14 goes on to say, And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we, will, that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Sounds so spiritual, right? Well, verse 15. Now, therefore, ye with the counsel signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told 
pole. Now, um, we do not have all those details recorded, but from what we do know, we can assume that Paul probably had some relatives among the uh, elite class of the Jewish leaders and the theologians and academics and rich guys there. And the uh, matter of fact, we find him to uh, be a former uh, member of the Sanhedrin of that, that council of leaders himself. And so, uh, as far as we can know, um, we, we might assume that, you know, he had some family connections there. Maybe even with some of the guys who were involved in this conspiracy. Regardless, one way or another, that little boy that Paul re was related with heard about him. And he figured, man, I ought to tell my relative about this. I need to warn him. And so really, he takes quite a risk in entering the prison and associating with a, a potential criminal, so to speak, with Paul and trying to help him out. And he tells Paul, verse 17, that Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul, the prisoner called me unto him, and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, who hath something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand, and went, and went with him aside privately, and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? So he can assume that this must have been a young boy. And verse 20 goes on to say, And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there, lie, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for promise from thee. So he's uncovering their de deceptive conspiracy there, their plot. Verse 22, So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these, thing, these things to me. And he called unto him two centurions, uh, there that, that was, that was, that were leaders, officers, so to speak, of, of a group of uh, soldiers, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, and spearmen two hundred, at the third hour of the night. So he is getting a huge guard along with them there. I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is a good-sized army almost. And provide them bees that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. Now then, if we turn into chapter 24, and so we'll, we'll jump over a bit of the details there, we find that after five days when Paul is being sent with his heavy military guard around him to Caesarea, so out of the reach of these guys in Jerusalem and seek to kill him, we find that after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus who informed the governor against Paul. And so what we can conclude from this, that these over 40 guys were fasting for at least five days already by the time they finally got to Caesarea to accuse Paul of treason and whatnot all. Now, I don't know about you, uh, what's the longest time that you've ever fasted, but by five days, you get pretty tired. You get, you get pretty hungry. <laughs> I mean, you're starting to, to really uh, need food. And uh, that's not where it stops, though, because they have this whole, whole court case there uh, with, um, um, with the governor, um, with, with uh, Felix in Caesarea, and there's really no conclusion to the case. And so what happens, as we look in Acts 24, verse 27, that after two years, the next governor comes in, Perseus Festus, and replaces Felix. And Felix uh, leaves Paul there in prison. Now, I don't know about you, but after two years of fasting, remember, Paul still hasn't been killed. After two years of fasting, I would be in pretty bad shape. <laughs> Matter of fact, I don't know if, if anybody could be alive for that. I doubt it. Um, uh, matter of fact, we know pretty sure that, that that would not be possible. And so we find that the high priest informs Festus and says, hey, we got this guy that we really like to get rid of called Paul. And so in verse 5, then Festus gives them the answer. 
It says, Let them therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man, if there be any wickedness in him. And so, once again, he prevents Paul from being, um, um, from being attacked somehow secretly uh, as he travels and being killed. And he says, no, you, he's up there in prison in Caesarea. It's a city north of Jerusalem. And so, you guys, if you want to have an uh, issue with Paul, you have to come up there where he is and where I am. Now, notice what he says, which among you are able. I find it a little bit funny because... I'm sure after two years and five days, a lot of these guys were not able to travel anymore if they've been fasting that long. Because <laughs> remember, they said, hey, we're going to have, we're going to ask for God to curse us if, if we start eating before Paul has been killed. And so this, these were over 40 days that had conspired um, a deadly conspiracy against Paul which really must have been very deadly for themselves, rather. We're not told anything about them stopping their fasting and breaking their, their conspiracy there. And so I don't know. I, I'd like to assume eventually they gave up or something. And um, they, they must have, even though they said, hey, we bound ourselves with a great curse. So I, I, I don't know how they justified all of that. Um, but the funny thing is, if they kept what they said they were going to do, they had to be fasting for over two years <laughs> to kill Paul. And um, so it seems at the end of this, uh, not too many of them were able to travel up to Caesarea anymore to finish the whole deal. Now, I don't know about you, but I think in a sense we can see a little bit of, of God's sense of humor here. Uh, we have these evil leaders these religious um, uh, influencers, so to speak, that have conspired themselves, that have united themselves to end a man's life. Now, I'd like to assume that they have great sincere motives in this. I mean, they were definitely very serious about it, so much so that over 40 guys promised God to stop eating until they had accomplished that whatever they considered a righteous cause. But the fact of the matter, they were trying to what in their eyes seemed to be a good cause. They were trying to accomplish that good cause with the evil methods, weren't they? They lied to that captain, to that officer. They, they, they were trying to be deceptive. They were trying to lay in way to, to, to murder a guy. How in the world could that be a righteous cause blessed best by God? And so, of course, it wasn't, and we find, rather, that these guys were stuck fasting for a long, long time. <laughs> and what are some things we can learn from this story? You know, we might chuckle, we might find it a little bit funny, how God is really uh, um, um, smashing all these evil plans, and how he is really, really making fun of, almost, of these guys uh, who've been trying to, um, to kill the, the messenger of God, the Apostle Paul. But the fact of the matter is, I think there's several things that we can learn from this. And the first thing that I'd like to mention tonight is, number one, sincerity does not equal godliness. Sincerity does not equal godliness. Notice here, I, I think we cannot um, get around the fact that they were extremely serious about this. They were very sincere. I mean, they all fasted. Over 40 guys. Fasting is uh, that free practice of abstaining from food or other pleasant things of life for the purpose of devoting oneself to God and concentrating on spiritual goals. In particular, the goal of defeating spiritual enemies, overcoming the lusts, of the flesh um, is a, a definition uh, by Dr. Cloud but the, uh, of fasting. And we see fasting uh, a thing that God commands throughout Scripture, right? When people are so serious about um, uh, a spiritual aspect of their life that they say, you know what, I'm going to put aside all these physical distractions and I'm even going to forego food because I need God so desperately in my life. 
So that's, in a sense, what these guys were trying to accomplish. But unfortunately, they had selfish goals, they had political goals, and they had um, evil goals and not spiritual ones, not godly ones. Now, no doubt they were very sincere about it. But sincerity does not automatically mean that it's a good cause or a godly cause, is it? We find in Mark chapter 9 that the Lord says that there are certain aspects in the spiritual battle that if you're a Christian here tonight, you and I are engaged in each and every day. Whether you're actively on guard uh, and watchful or whether you're just floating along and, and just you know, being chopped left, right, and center by the enemy without maybe sometimes not even noticing or caring, the fact of the matter is you're in a battle. And it's a good cause. It's a righteous battle. And it's a battle for the glory of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ in your life. Because remember, the enemy of God cannot have your soul anymore. You've been purchased by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're once and forever all gods. But he sure would love to destroy your life. He sure would love to hurt your family. And he sure would love to destroy any good or any usefulness you could bring for the cause of Christ in this world. And so let's not be fooled, amen? Let's not be sleeping around spiritually, but let's rather be on guard. And there are some uh, aspects um, of that intense warfare that God says that those kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. And so fasting ought to be a regular a part of every Christian's walk with God, I believe. Matter of fact, uh, we, we find that the uh, Lord Jesus Christ uh, says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, and he didn't say, if you fast, did he? He, he just expected that that would be something his followers would be engaged in. That what, that would be part of their life, their walk with God, as they're serious about the spiritual battle they are in. Not if you fast, but when you fast. Amen. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a set countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I send to you, they have their reward. And so in other words, let's make sure that our fasting is in the eyes of God primarily, and not in regards for, not for the purpose of others, considering us also spiritual, right? Um, now, even though we do not really find God commanding fasting as such, he consistently commends it in his children. And God, of course, will never force us to fast. That's a voluntary decision that we need to make. Um, but at the same time, I believe that he does expect and wants us to fast, though, um, whenever necessary. And so we see that these guys are serious about this. And they are very sincere about it. But that doesn't make it godly, does it? Now, I don't know what aspects of your Christian life uh, or my Christian life we might be extremely sincere about. And, you know, I've, I've heard so many times uh, people defending one another maybe, you know, when, when, when somebody's life is being lined up with the Scripture and it's like, well, you yeah, understand they believe wrong or they, they do this wrong. But, you know, they're very sincere in it. There's a lot of sincere people that unfortunately will end up in hell because they did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, as the Scripture says, but rather maybe trusted in their own righteousness. Maybe they believed they somehow had to continue to impress God with their good works to not lose God's forgiveness. Or um, they trusted in, in, in their baptism somehow or their church membership or whatever it might have been. And so they might be extremely sincere about it, but unfortunately that doesn't help. <laughs> That doesn't make it right. Um, and there might be many things that you and I might be also sincere about. But let me ask you this. Is it for selfish purposes or is it for the glory of God? That's what the Lord rebukes um, the nation of Israel through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 58. And, and I'd like to encourage you to turn there with me. Now, I'd, I'd really love to read the entire context there, but we do, um, are not able to take the time for that tonight. I just want to read one verse there in Isaiah 58 and verse 4. 
Isaiah is a fairly large book, has 66 chapters to be exact. And so it should be relatively easy to find in your Old Testament. And there in Isaiah 58, verse 4. Isaiah 58, verse 4. And once again, I encourage you to read the entire context there because it's really all about that there. Behold, he fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. And so, all the way back then already, there were people in Israel that were fasting to accomplish selfish purposes. In other words, maybe I want God to, uh, to uh, maybe I want to see God punish so-and-so because, you know, they were mean to me. Or, you know, they got promoted when I didn't, or something of that sort. And so I'm going to fast and pray to let God know that I'm really serious about this and to kind of force God's hand into accomplishing what I want. And for strife and debate and, and really to see my own cause succeed and not for the glory of God. Now, no matter how sincere you are in that, that's wicked. And that's evil, and God rebukes that, amen, there among the people of Israel. And says, you know what, that's, that's not the kind of fast that I'm going to uh, hear. That's not the kind of fast that I desire in you. Whenever we fast in a godly manner, we by that fasting acknowledge the seriousness and sincerity of the spiritual battle we are engaged in. And then by that subduing of our physical body, we make our spiritual needs of utmost importance in our life. In other words, God becomes our all-consuming focus. I mean, just think about it. When you fast, and you do that for half a day, for a day, for, fruit, for two days, and, and by the way, if you have health issues, make sure you check with the doctor before you do that, all right? Um, you start to become really hungry, right? I mean, I don't know, maybe you've had to skip a meal for one reason or another, uh, or, or you've, you've tried fasting before, and, um, and after half a day for sure, I mean, all you can think about is food, right? And, and I mean, it starts to growl in your stomach, and, and you know, uh, um, at the end of the day, you, you might be all tired and weak, and I mean, by the second day, I mean, it's just food, 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 that's all in your mind. It's basically your consuming focus. You see, but that's the whole point of fasting. To replace what our body naturally would crave and revolve around and to subdue that through discipline and rather make our focus, our, uh, what consumes us, just like hunger would consume our physical body, make God our focus and what consumes me spiritually and, and in my heart and mind and my thoughts. That's the real point of fasting. And the, as we thereby get closer and closer to God, we find that God, um, th that we get into a position spiritually to get victory and uh, to hear, uh, for God to hear our prayers. Paul himself really had to learn that lesson the hard way too. That just because you're sincere does not mean that God is in it. Um, in Galatians chapter 1, we read in verse 13 of his life before his salvation. He was very religious, very sincere, right? It says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. So Paul says, hey, I, I mean, I was among the best of them. I was extremely sincere, but it didn't mean I was blessed by God. It didn't mean that it was in a godly way. Verse 23, in Galatians chapter 1, he goes on to say, But they, that those churches, had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorify God in me. We see uh, that similarly described there, uh, in his conversion account of Acts chapter 22. And, and so in other words, Paul was extremely sincere in persecuting Christians. 
He honestly saw, thought that he has to be extremely serious about ripping family support, murdering people, destroying their lives, because he thought he's doing this for the glory of God. He was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong, wasn't he? He was sincerely wrong. So let me ask you this. You and I could fall into that same trap too. Oh, I'm just, just very sincere in having the wrong, wrong priorities in my life. But I'm so sincere about it. Oh, I, I do it out of love for my family, or I do it out of love for this, or to please my boss, or to, to you know, uh, make so-and-so in the church happy. <laughs> Whatever it may be, that is our wrong focus, our wrong priorities, that no matter how sincere we are in it, does not necessarily mean, though, that it's godly. And so let's maybe do take time to pray and fast, rather, to make sure that our goals and our priorities that we pursue in life with sincerity are those things that God would want us to pursue. Amen? And so that he can bless that. Um, now, the second thing I'd like to mention tonight is another lesson we can learn from these 40 guys that really messed up with their conspiracy and must have gone hungry for a long time. That's number two. The end does not justify the means. The end does not justify the means. Now, this is a lesson that really is being missed in our day and age completely. Apparently, if you believe that your cause is righteous, you can do whatever you need to do to accomplish that. I mean, just turn on the news and you see that. I mean, whether it's rioting or looting or anarchy or, or arson, burning stuff down. I mean, even beating people up, yelling at them, maybe even killing them. Hey, it's, if it's for the cause of some kind of perceived justice, hey, it, it's, it's good enough. And that is not biblical. And that is not right. The end does not justify the means. And in particular, not in our relationship to God. Even if your cause is just and is righteous, or even godly or biblical, it still has to be accomplished also in righteous means. In other words, in the methods, in the way we try to get there, that has to be right as well. Romans chapter 3, verse 8 says, And not rather as we be slanderously reported in the sum of firm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. It's a rhetorical question that Paul has there and says, hey, you know what, so uh, if, if I get more grace and more forgiveness of God, um, the more I sin, then I probably should sin more, right, to experience more of God's mercy in my life. Well, no, <laughs> no absolutely not. Shall we, con shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, Romans 6 says, right? Moses, I believe, is a biblical example of having to learn that lesson. And we won't, uh, uh, for the sake of time, we won't be able to go into all the details tonight. But there in Acts chapter 7, his uh, story is recounted. And we find there that as a young man, he figures that God has chosen him to bring justice to the oppressed uh, 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 slaves there, the Israelites in Egypt. And so God's going to use him to set them free. And I mean, God wouldn't want his people to be beaten and oppressed, would he? And so obviously this cause is righteous and just. And so when an Egyptian mistreated a, a, an Israelite, a Hebrew, uh, Moses chimed in there and just took the guy out. And, and, and surely God's going to use that to break his people free, right? No wrong. The cause of, that Moses was pursuing might have been all great and righteous, but his methods definitely weren't. And so God couldn't bless it. God could not bless it. And, 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 and killing was not the way God wanted to set his people free. And so uh, Moses was rejected by the one Israelites even and said, hey, the next day someone says, hey, are you going to kill me like you killed the other Egyptian guy the other day? And Moses was like, oh man, people notice this. This is not going to go well for me. And so he has to flee into the desert for 40 years. And God has to humble him and work on his heart until he's ready to set the people of God free God's way. Amen. And um, Moses had to learn that the end does not justify the means. A wrong for the sake of right does not make it right. Amen. You cannot accomplish good by doing evil. I mean, never. 
You cannot accomplish good by doing evil. And folks, let me just say this. We've really been trained to think that way, though. I mean, you, you watch just about any hero Hollywood movie. I mean, it is justified to shoot up dozens and dozens of people, to blow up stuff. I mean, if necessary, to torture people to get their information. Whatever it may be, because, hey, the, the cause is righteous or just, you know, his family member needs to be set free, or the world needs to be saved, or whatever the storyline may be in Hollywood. And they've, Hollywood has really started to train, to think us for generations, uh, uh, excuse me, has really started to train us in our thinking that, well, you know, if necessary, I just need to do evil as long as it accomplishes something good. And that's not the way God does things, though. By the way, that's not how we can do things in the church, neither. You know, sometimes I wish I could force people into doing what is right, but I can't, and I shouldn't. <laughs> Amen. So you and I have no right to force people into doing what maybe you or I think would be best for them. And rather, um, we need to uh, follow the Lord and um, as, as he teaches us in Amos chapter 5, where it says, See good and not evil, that ye may live. Amen. Even when we are mistreated, Romans 12 tells us to recompense, to pay back to no man evil for evil. But rather, if possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Amen. So even if somebody treats me unjustly, whether it be a Christian or a non-Christian, then I surely... Uh, I'm justified to really get them back, right? No. Even when you're treated e e in an evil way, whether it be by the government, by a person in church, by a co-worker, by whoever it may be, family member, the godly way is to not respond in the same manner. Now, folks, it takes a close relationship with Christ to be able to have the power, the discipline to not do that. Amen. Say not thou, I will recompense evil, Proverbs says, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. Wait on the Lord, and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee, Psalm 37 says. So there's a third thing I want us to notice here in regards to the story of the this deadly conspiracy that was facing the Apostle Paul. And that's that, the story of that little boy. Now, we're never really given the name of that boy, are we? He's somehow related to Paul, um, his, his sister's son, and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, he has a significant role in saving the life of the Apostle Paul. Amen? I mean, who knows how many books of our Holy Bible might have not been able to, 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 to be written because Paul's life was cut short. Because that boy was tired and hungry and figured he's going to go home to mommy and rather sleep over this. And he can still tell this somebody to, to more. No. Thankfully, God put it upon his heart to run to the right people right away and, and, and get that information out there as soon as you heard it. And what can we learn from that? Number three, God can use small people to overthrow big plans that are evil. <laughs> now, this may sound like a big mouthful, but note, listen to this again. God can use small people to overthrow big plans that are evil. You know, folks, I wish I would have these, uh, you know, some fun illustration like I had this morning with the squeaky toys. And so if you missed that, you can go ahead online and watch the video about that. Uh, how we're preaching through the book of Ephesians and some, seeing some really exciting truths there. But what we do have, though, through our scripture is stories that illustrate these truths. And so there in John chapter 6, once again, unfortunately, we don't have the time tonight to read the whole story there, but you can write down the reference and read it yourself. In John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, we read how uh, God is using a small boy's lunch to feed the multitudes. And you're probably familiar with this story. Um, and how the disciples come to him and say, hey, you know, we don't have enough money to buy food for all of these. I mean, you know, not, not even a little bite for everyone. So many people to feed. And yet it's no problem for God. 
because there's a little boy who is willing to give everything he had into the hands of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ prayed over it, blessed it, gave it to the disciples to hand out, and those five barley loaves and two small fishes were enough to feed these over 5,000 people. That's a miracle of God. But you know what? The exciting truth is that little is much when God is in it. Amen? It's a beautiful song that maybe you're familiar with. And little is much when God is in it, even in your life, my dear friend. And God can make a great difference even with the seemingly most insignificant of people if they're just willing to yield themselves and fully allow God to use their life. In whatever seemingly insignificant and non-noticed and non-praised way it may ever be. Little is much when God is in it. And folks, that story of God feeding thousands of people with this little boy's lunch, those uh, five loaves and two small fishes, is, is uh, um, uh, the only miracle recorded in all four of the gospel accounts. In Matthew chapter 14, in Mark chapter 6, in Luke chapter 9, and in John chapter 6. God took notice of the little boy with the lunch and made a huge impact for thousands. Amen? Now, dear friends, God wants to use your life and my life in the same way. You may not think that you have much to offer God. You may not think that, well, well God, I really I don't have so much time for you. Really, I, God, I, I don't have all the Bible knowledge. I, I, I don't feel very powerful spiritually, or I don't know how to witness and how to say all the right things. But you know what? If you're just willing, if you're just yielded to allow God to use you in the way that He sees fit, to allow God to use whatever He has given you of abilities and possessions and time and resources in your life, don't ever estimate the power of God and what he can do with small people. Amen? God changed the course of history in a sense and uh, it changed uh, maybe even, even all the books our Bible contains just by that little, little relative of Paul getting wind of that conspiracy and God using him to save Paul's life. Now there's one last thing I'd like to mention in closing tonight. And that is number four that we can learn from this story of these conspirators that possibly all died. <laughs> number four, God protects his children. God protects his children, often without them even knowing it. Paul had no idea about this going on. I mean, what is he going to do about 40 guys laying in wait while he's being brought from his prison cell to the courtyard? There's no way he has got even any chance. God protects his children often without them knowing it. Paul had no part or parcel in, in his relative getting wind of that story. God did all of that. And he took care of Paul before Paul even knew that he was in need of God's help. And my dear friend, he can do the same for you and for me today in 2020. In Psalm chapter 34 Verse 7, we read that the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. And you know, throughout Scripture, we, we see this idea of what we call your guardian angel, right? And you know, a lot of people, maybe even they just scrape by an almost accident in traffic or whatever it may be, uh, you know, some say, like, man, you must have had a guardian angel on, on watch for you that day. But you know what? You actually do. <laughs> you actually do. If you're seeking to live uh, uh, with God and if you're uh, saved here tonight and, and, and you have a desire to live uh, uh, under God's blessing, God is more than happy to look out for you. And if necessary, he'll, he'll delegate a whole legion of angels to camp round about you and watch over you. That's what he did in 2 Kings chapter 6 for Elisha. I'll just read that story for you real quick. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 14, um, the enemy king of Israel there is, is sending his horses and chariots and a great host, a huge army, to the city where Elisha the prophet, the man of God, was living. Um, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, in 2 Kings 6, verse 15, 
When he was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And so, you, you know, today we can compare that with artillery and, and, and tanks. And, you know, you know, maybe we could picture, uh, you know, a, a huge um, uh, air force. I mean, I mean it, it was just an overwhelming force. I mean, they were going to be put into, into dust and ashes before the end of the day, for sure. And a servant said unto him, so Elisha's servant to him says, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Amen? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, Jesus Christ says. Well, yeah, in this world we shall have tribulation, but be not afraid, my little children. Be not afraid, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Verse 17, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. I mean, there was a whole heavenly army round about watching over the man of God. And God will look out for his beloved children. And he, he's, he's given that promise uh, continually throughout Scripture. And so many times, I think you and I need to remember to recognize how God is looking out for us and protecting us. And maybe we need to thank God for our guardian angels, maybe more often. In Psalm chapter 91 we read in verse 9, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Folks, God wants to protect you. He wants to look out for us. And you see, that's why we can say with confidence, not with arrogancy, not with ignorance, not with foolishness. You know, I'm not saying, well, God's promised your guardian angel, so you just go ahead and jump off the cliffs because nothing's going to happen to you. You know, oh, you know, oh just, just go speeding in traffic because, you know, you won't die unless God wants it to. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what the Bible says at all. But rather what it teaches us to not live in the spirit and bondage of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, amen, but of power and of love and of a, of a sound, a clear, healthy thinking mind. And so, yes, we ought to be prudent and, and foreseeing the evil. Yes, we ought to be um, uh, of wise, but at the same time, we also can be confident and trust in God to take care of us and to watch over his children and to, to uh, protect us. And uh, um, it, matter of fact, God doesn't just send his, his angels to, to guard us in and, and, and round about. In Psalm chapter 5, it says in verse 12, For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, will thou compass him as with a shield. Psalm 139, verse 3 says, Thou compassest my path, in my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. God himself will make it his personal task to watch over his dear child. I mean, which father in this world wouldn't? Amen? If I trust somebody to babysit my children, I mean, it better be the very best I can find. I'm not going to just pick a guy off the street that just come, comes randomly walking by and say, hey, thank you for watching out for my child for the next hour. No, it's going to be somebody I absolutely trust. It's going to be somebody that's going to be absolutely capable to take care of my child, hopefully at least as good as I would. And I, I know as parents, you would do absolutely the same, wouldn't you? And so that's where God sends his guardian angel, so to speak, to compass us around and watch over us, just like he did with the Apostle Paul. There was a conspiracy of over 40 guys that fasted for selfish, uh, for, for deceptive, for religious reasons, and, and not for godly and spiritual reasons, and were out to kill him and to lie in wait. And God had already along a plan and people in place 
to protect his child. Watch out for him. And that's why he comes to, to Paul by night and says, Hey, Paul, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. We'll be all okay. I got this, Paul. I got this. Be of good cheer. So we might chuckle. We might be um, a bit amused at the foolishness and the, the unfortunately misguided sincerity of these 40 religious guys of the Jewish leadership there uh, conspiring uh, to take the life of Paul. And, you know, after uh, over two years later, <laughs> he still is, is, is doing just fine. Um, and God is continuing to use him in a mighty way. And, and so that's where you and I just really, in conclusion, have to recognize that, you know, God's ways are not like our ways, are they? Amen? And uh, he is looking out for us. Notice the Apostle Paul was still in prison. Still, things weren't all rosy and perfect for him. But you know what? God was right there with him. And God was watching out for his child. And it's just like the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 23, that good shepherd that loves his sheep so much he would give his life for that sheep, yes, sometimes has to lead that sheep through a dark, lonesome valley. But you know what? Never without the shepherd by his side. And never without the, 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 the comfort and the guidance of his staff and his voice as he leads us along. Amen? And so let's remember that sincerity does not always equal godliness. Let's remember that the end does not justify the means. Righteous, a righteous cause has to be accomplished by righteous and godly and biblical means or to be blessed by God. Let's remember that God very much can use even seemingly small people to accomplish great things. And let's remember that as we go through these sometimes uncertain, some, yeah, sometimes frightening days, amen, let's remember that God is still watching out for us. And that just like Elisha, if need be, he can put a whole legion of angels, a whole army of angels around us, but not just that, he himself has committed himself to the personal care of you and me, his child. I don't know about you, but that is a great comfort, hey, Mom? That's something I can take into this week and say, thank you, God. Help me to remember to trust you and to, to have confidence in you and your care for me so that I don't have to succumb to worry, to fear, and, and, and that, that bondage of fear, but rather I can confidently say as as the New Testament teaches us, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is going to be my helper. I'll be fine. He's, he's promised to never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. So I'd like to invite you to stand with, uh, uh, with me this evening here and uh, just stand to our feet and bow our heads and close our eyes in prayer. And only the Lord really knows where exactly you're at in your life. But the fact of the matter is, I believe sooner or later all of us can use this encouragement that God is personally looking out for, protecting, and watching over his child. Let me ask you this first and foremost. Are you truly, really a child of God? I'm not asking you whether you've prayed a religious prayer at some point. I'm asking you whether, whether you know all the facts of the gospel and all the Bible stories. I'm asking, have you truly repented from your heart of your guilt before God and ask Him to be your Savior, relying, trusting fully in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Or salvation in Christ is so simple, and yet it cost Him everything. Do you have peace with God tonight? Or oh, it's just a humble prayer away. Why would we linger? Why wait? Dear children of God, when was the last time you thanked God for watching over you with his guardian angels? When was the last time I said, you know what, I can face this day because I know the Lord is personally surrounding me and watching over me. Maybe there are some spiritual battles you're facing in your life and you're saying, man, I've prayed so sincerely. I'm so earnest about it. Maybe that is one of those kind that does not go out but by prayer and fasting. But as, as you fast and as you pray, make sure you do it for the right reasons 
and for the right motivations. Maybe there are some priorities in your life that are good and that you're very sincere about. But maybe you've been approaching them with the wrong means. Maybe you've been trying to please one good thing in your life by allowing something else to suffer. Can I encourage you tonight? God wants to give you wisdom. God wants you to walk each and every day close by his side and ask him, Lord, what is your will for this day for me? That's what we preached on this morning. Why not get up every day and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do today? God, what are your priorities? I want to live under your blessing. Please help me. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this just encouragement from your word. Or truly, we do not have to live in fear because greater is he that is in us than in, that is in the world. And Lord, we know and believe and trust that just like with the Apostle Paul, Lord, there was an evil conspiracy against this life and you had already long taken care of all the details to watch out for your child. And Father, even in these uncertain days, we know that you're watching over us. I just want to thank you for that. God, we don't deserve your care. God, we don't deserve your love and your mercy. And we just want to thank you for it. God, I pray you'd help me, you help all of us each and every day to cast all of our cares upon thee because we know that you care for us. And Father, I pray that you would please bless each and every decision that was made tonight. Please bless each and every person that has come out tonight. And uh, Father, help us to truly accomplish your ways with your means, your methods this week. Father, help us to be reminded that even though our life might seem small and insignificant, as long as we give it all to you, Father, there's nothing that would be impossible. We pray that you will please bless us now. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, well, uh, you may be seated. We're almost done for tonight. I uh, just want to take a few minutes together uh, in prayer tonight as we close off. And so I'll just give Anthony a minute there to turn things off. And uh, then I'd like to ask him once again to lead us in the, our prayer time here. And so um, are there any prayer?